students. I'm excited to be here again today with very interesting topic in basic science. My name is Eitayo Adeoye. Before we go into today's topic, let's quickly go over what we learned in the previous lesson. Sanitation was the topic. We said sanitation is the hygienic means of promoting health through prevention of human contact with the hazard of waste as well as treatment and proper disposal of sewage and refuse. Proper disposal of sewage and refuse. Now, we said that refuse is a combination of solid and dry waste. Combination of solid and dry waste. We also said that sanitation is majorly done by proper disposal of sewage and refuse. We divided refuse into two groups. We said we have biodegradable refuse and non-biodegradable refuse. We said that biodegradable refuse materials, they are waste materials that can decay. They are waste materials that can decay. Can you tell me the example given in the last class? Yes, we said peels of yam, banana, these materials, they can decay. Stocks of vegetable, they can decay. So we group them under biodegradable waste, biodegradable refuse. We said also that the second group of refuse is non-biodegradable, non-biodegradable. We said these materials, they cannot decay. They cannot decay. Can you give me an example? Oh, we mentioned can, plastics, and some other examples. Now, we went further to talk about sewage. We said sewage is the mixture, the mixture of human and liquid waste. Mixture of human and liquid waste that we need to dispose all these materials properly in order to have clean environment, in order to have clean environment and to prevent us from different disease vectors, different disease vectors that we can have. You were also given an assignment, if you can remember, to enumerate five consequences Five consequences of poor hygiene. Five consequences of poor hygiene. I believe you have done yours. What are these consequences? Poor health. Poor health. Low self-esteem. Low self-esteem. Also, Breeding of disease vectors. Breeding of disease vectors. Can you give me more at home? What of pollution of the hair? Pollution of the hair and also death is also among the consequences of poor hygiene. On this note, I want to appreciate all the students that forwarded their answers. You have all done well. Keep it up. God bless you. Now, let us go into today's topic. Depletion of the ozone layer. Depletion of the ozone layer. At the end of today's lesson, you should be able to, one, explain the meaning of ozone layer, the meaning of ozone layer. You should also be able to describe 
the location of the ozone layer. The location of the ozone layer also to explain, explain the depletion of the ozone layer. To explain the, the depletion of the ozone layer and to identify the effects, the effects and ways of controlling the depletion of ozone layer. Ways of controlling the depletion of the ozone layer. Now, students, have you ever felt sun intensity on your skin on a hot afternoon? Mm. Despite the distance, of the sun from the head. Sun gives out rays, which include ultraviolet rays. And I want you to also know that too much exposure to ultraviolet rays is dangerous to our health. Too much exposure to ultraviolet rays is dangerous to our health. And that is why this topic is very, very important. Now, what is ozone layer? What is ozone layer? Ozone layer is a naturally made protective layer. Naturally made protective layer that prevents some harmful some of the harmful rays of the sun from reaching the head. It prevents some of the harmful rays of the sun from reaching the head. So it's a naturally made protective layer. Now, from the picture shown on the screen, I want us to take a look at it. We said that ozone layer is a naturally made layer, protective layer, that prevents some of the harmful rays of the sun from reaching the head. Now, look at this picture on the screen. In this picture, we are able to see the Earth atmosphere. The Earth atmosphere. From the picture, we could see that the Earth atmosphere is in layers. Now, when we look at this picture very well, the first layer we'll see is called troposphere. Can you repeat it after me? Troposphere. Now, troposphere, as we can see from the picture, that is where we have aircraft, the, the aircraft flight, the troposphere. Also, the next stage, the next region, which is of interest today, is stratosphere. Stratosphere. Can you say it? Stratosphere. That is where ozone layer is. Ozone layer is located in the what? The lower part of the stratosphere. As you can see from the picture. So if I want to ask you now, the location of ozone layer, we said it's a naturally made protective layer. So where can it be found? Can you answer me? In the lower part of where? The stratosphere. Stratosphere, that's where we have the ozone layer. And from the picture, you can see the different layers that we have. But the one we are particular about on this topic, the depletion of ozone layer is the stratosphere. Now, from this, we could see that our God is so loving. Our God is so caring. You know, as creation, he made layers in the atmosphere to protect us from harmful effects of radiation from the sun. Hmm. Do you know his word also say, the sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. 
our God is wonderful. Now, having known that, let's, what do we mean by ozone? The word ozone. Ozone is a natural gas. A natural gas that is composed of three atoms of oxygen. Its chemical symbol is O3. As we have seen, not like this, but like this. Three atoms of oxygen. That is, we have seen the chemical symbol. It is blue, pale blue in color, and has strong odor. It's a natural gas composed of how many atoms of oxygen? Three. Blue, pale blue in color, and a strong odor. Ozone is totally different from the normal oxygen that we breathe in. Oxygen has two atoms of oxygen. The normal oxygen we breathe in has two atoms. It is colorless and odorless. While ozone is what? Can you tell me the color? Pale blue and has strong odor. Now, having known what ozone is, natural gas, let's go to the meaning of the topic itself, depletion of the ozone layer. From the word depletion, it can mean reduction. So when we say depletion of the ozone layer, it means the what? Re the reduction in the thickness of ozone gas in the atmosphere. Reduction in the thickness of ozone gas in the atmosphere. Now, it can also mean gradual thinning. Gradual thinning of Earth's ozone layer. Gradual thinning of Earth's ozone layer. You can also say that depletion of the ozone layer is the wearing out of the amount of ozone in the stratosphere. You know, the other time we said ozone layer is found where? In the stratosphere, which happens to be the second layer in the Earth's atmosphere. So, wearing out or gradual reduction in the amount of ozone in the stratosphere. Now, let's go proceed. In this, in this lesson today. We have talked about the meaning of ozone layer. We have also talked about what ozone is. And now, let's go. What are the causes of depletion of the ozone layer? Causes of the depletion of the ozone layer. The depletion of the ozone layer is majorly caused by human activities that resulted into accumulation of chemicals. What are these chemicals? When we are talking about depletion of the ozone layer, and we mention that it is majorly caused by human activities, what are the chemicals that we are talking about? We have halons, and the number general one that most of us may know is what we call chlorofluorocarbon. Chlorofluorocarbon. Sometimes in your textbook you see it's a CFC, chlorofluorocarbon. Chlorofluorocarbon and other related compounds 
are released into the atmosphere. And where do we find all these things we've mentioned? I mentioned alons and chlorofluorocarbon. Yes, this material, these chemicals are used in industry that manufactures things like insulating foams, solvents, those that manufacture styrofoam containers. We also, they, are, they also use in the industry that manufacture cooling things. Can you give me an example of cooling things? Air conditioners, refrigerators. Yes, these materials, this particular chemical, chlorofluorocarbon, is used. Is used now. Let's quickly go into the process of depletion. Depletion of the ozone layer, like I said, is majorly caused by what? The release of CFC, the chlorofluorocarbon, and other depleting substances. When they are emitted into the atmosphere, what happens? Now, let's examine this picture together. In the picture you are seeing on the screen, in the stratosphere, when this CFC is released, this CFC what, rises up into where? The stratosphere. On getting to the stratosphere, what happens? Strong ultraviolet light breaks the chlorofluorocarbon to release chlorine and also allons to release bromine. The, the, these two atoms that I've mentioned, chlorine and bromine, actually destroy ozone layer, not CFC as a whole. It is the atom that I mentioned, chlorine, when strong ultraviolet light breaks them to release chlorine from this, also release bromine from allons, and it is these two atoms that actually destroy the ozone layer. It is estimated that one chlorine atom can destroy over 100,000 ozone molecules. Can you see? So from the picture, we can see that when CFC is released, it goes into where? The stratosphere. We could see the layers, the layer of ozone in this picture in the first stage that was very thick. And after the depletion, we could see that the thickness has reduced. Another thing we can see from this picture is that the ultraviolet rays are being prevented by the ozone layer, and little ray of this ultraviolet ray come into where the head. And after the depletion, what happened? We can see that much of these ultraviolet rays are released into what the head. And then after this, what can we experience? What are the effects of ozone layer depletion? Now, we told us that it is what dangerous, too much exposure to these ultraviolet rays are what is dangerous to our health. Appearance of several forms of cancer appearance of several forms of cancer, severe sunburns, we have cataracts, rapid aging of skin, lower resistance against infectious diseases. How do we control this depletion, depletion of ozone layer? How do we control it? We can, government can ban, put a ban on the use of chlorofluorocarbon, and also to use ozone-friendly chemicals. As an individual, what can you do to reduce this? You can also stop buying materials that are made from this chemical, chlorofluorocarbon. Now, I believe today we are able to explain ozone layer, that it is what? The naturally made protective layer that prevents some of the harmful 
rays of the sun from reaching the earth. We also said, we also described the location of the ozone layer. Where can we find the ozone layer? Stratosphere, good of you. Also, we have identified some effects and ways of controlling the depletion of the ozone layer. The depletion of the ozone layer. I believe as from now, you will not contribute to the depletion of the ozone layer. Now, before I go, let me quickly give you this assignment to attempt. State four more effects of the depletion of ozone layer. Till I come your way next time. God bless you. Bye. to you viewers. You are welcome to CRSM virtual class. My name is Olubumi Thompson Akinawunu. And the subject we are going to have now is chemistry. The topic is qualitative analysis. Qualitative analysis. And the subtopic is detection of cations. Detection of cations. This is actually the continuation of our last class. By the grace of God, last, in our last class, we tried to look at the meaning of qualitative analysis. I said qualitative analysis involves detection of anions and cations that are present in ionic compound. Do you still remember? I equally said it also involves the identification of functional groups or detection of functional groups that are present in organic compound. I believe you still remember. Then we look at the meaning of cations. And we said cations are positive ions. And we give example, examples of about eight of them. And we also look at the apparatus that we use to carry out qualitative analysis. I believe you still remember. Can you mention some of them? OK, test tube, boiling tube, we equally have spatula. I showed you all these things in our last class. Hand gloves, laboratory coat, test tube rack, and wash button. We also look at the reagents. Don't forget the two reagents needed in carrying out qualitative analysis. Am I hearing you saying it? Sodium hydroxide solution, yes, and ammonia solution. And then we look at the procedures for carrying out qualitative analysis when you want to detect cations. I said there are, simple, there are basically four procedures, which you'll see on the screen, at least for you to remember. You prepare the solution of the sample that you want to test for. After that, you divide it into two portions. To the first portion, you add sodium hydroxide solution in drops, then, in excess. To the second portion, you do almost the same thing, but this time around with ammonia solution. That is, you add ammonia solution in drops and then in excess. You will also recall that in our last class, we tried to test for copper two ion. 
that blue solution that you saw, copper two ion. When we add sodium hydroxide in drops, we have blue gelatinous precipitate. When we add sodium hydroxide in excess to the blue gelatinous precipitate, we discover that the blue gelatinous precipitate remain insoluble. But when we try it with ammonia, adding ammonia to copper two ion in drops gave us pale blue gelatinous precipitate. On adding excess ammonia to it, the pale blue gelatinous precipitate dissolves to form a deep blue solution. And I gave you, I gave you an assignment that you should describe how to detect zinc 2 ion using sodium hydroxide solution and ammonia solution. Some of you responded brilliant performance. And I want you to keep it up because I'm still going to give you another assignment today at the end of the class. So today now, we want to continue with detection of cations. By the grace of God, we will do more than one cations today. So we are going to start with the question I gave you, zinc ion. And because of time, we have already prepared the solutions of the samples that we want to test for. So this one that you see here now is a zinc salt that has been dissolved in water. Zinc tetrazo sulfate 6. This is the chemical here. So it has been dissolved already in water. You recall that I told you that when you are carrying out tests for cations, the salt given to you must be a soluble salt. That is a salt that dissolves in water. Now, I'm going to, we are going to carry out the experiment quite all right. What we are going to do now is to divide this into two portions. Let's take this as the first portion. Then let's take this as the second portion, the two portions. So we are going to add sodium hydroxide solution to the first portion and see what we are going to see. Sodium hydroxide solution added in draw first. I don't know whether you'll be able to see it. There is white gelatinous precipitate. I want you to differentiate between the two. No, this is colorless, like water. This one now is white, gelatinous precipitate. We have added sodium hydroxide. Now what we do now is to add excess sodium hydroxide to it to see what is going to happen. Add sodium hydroxide in excess. I'm adding it now in excess. What do you see? You see that the gelatinous precipitate we have before is dissolving gradually to give a clear solution. So the test now means, don't forget, this thing is labeled Y, because the name of the salt will not be given to you. So Y, aqueous, because it has been dissolved in water, plus sodium hydroxide in drops gave us white gelatinous precipitate. But plus sodium hydroxide solution in excess the white precipitate dissolves. See, you can't see any whitish thing here now. Good. So, what are we going to do next? We are going to add ammonia to the second, to the second portion. We first add it in drops and see what is going to happen. Then we all equally add it in excess. Like what we have before, adding it in drops, you see, is white gelatinous precipitate. Now let's add it in excess. You see, the white gelatinous precipitate is dissolving gradually and is becoming clearer. That is the reason, when you are doing it, you must first add it in drugs. Don't add excess to it because the white precipitate may be dissolving and you may not know. So how do we write this now? You know, I told you, whenever you are carrying out qualitative analysis, you present it on a table. You are going to see the table, it will be displayed on the screen. Test, observation, and inference. So when we add the sodium hydroxide in drop, the observation is white gelatinous precipitate. When it is added in excess, white gelatinous precipitate soluble, or it dissolves. Now, when you use sodium hydroxide and the white precipitate is dissolving in excess, that shows that 
zinc 2 ion or aluminum ion is present. What am I saying? It is not only zinc 2 ion that dissolves in excess sodium hydroxide. It is not only what? Zinc 2 ion that dissolves in excess sodium hydroxide. Aluminum ion too does that. So the fact that you have white gelatinous precipitate and the white gelatinous precipitate dissolve in excess sodium hydroxide doesn't mean that it is zinc 2 ion. And that is what I want to correct uh, for some of you that submitted your assignment. So the inference is going to be zinc 2 plus, that is zinc 2 ion, or aluminum ion is present. Okay? But now to differentiate between the two, when ammonia is added, as I have shown it to you, in drops, you still have white gelatinous precipitates. In excess, you have the white gelatinous precipitates also dissolving. That differentiated zinc 2 ion from what? From aluminum ion. Aluminum ion doesn't do that. So when you see the white precipitate dissolving, it, shows, it is showing that zinc 2 ion is what is present. Is that clear now? So how do you write it if it is aluminum ion? If it is aluminum ion, now when, you add, when sodium hydroxide uh, solution is added, when so in drops and in excess, the observation you are going to have is the same thing as that of zinc 2 ion. But when ammonia solution is added for aluminum ion, the white precipitate is insoluble. Whereas for zinc 2 ion, the white precipitate is soluble. That is when ammonia is added in excess. So don't forget that. So we are true with zinc 2 ion and aluminum ion. We want to test for another cation. This time around, lead 2 ion. Lead 2 ion. And lead 2 ion is represented here. Lead, we are representing the solution of lead 2 ion with letter F. Actually, it is lead 2 trouser nitrate 5. This is lead 2 trouser nitrate 5. Some of you may see the name. So, and nitrates, most nit all, all nitrates dissolve in water. So, in the, in the same vein, too, we are going to divide this into two. We are going to divide it into two. Okay, this is the first portion. I believe you can see. So we are going to add sodium hydroxide solution. Sodium hydroxide solution in drops. Have you seen it? Good. Then we add it in excess and see. Wow. Do you see that when you add excess to it, what happens? Am I hearing you saying it? The white precipitate dissolves to give a, a colorless solution. So that means the three, the three cations that I've talked about today, zinc 2 ion, aluminum ion, and Li 2 ion, they have a similarity. The three of them, when you add sodium hydroxide in drops and in excess, the same observation. In drops, white precipitate is formed in the case of lead, but in the case of zinc 2 and aluminum, the white precipitate is gelatinous. But by the time you now add excess for zinc and aluminum, the white precipitate will, uh, will dissolve. The white gelatinous precipitate will dissolve. The same way for lead, too. As I have demonstrated it, the white precipitate is only dissolving. The only difference between the two, uh, between the three, is that zinc and aluminum, they are the same. But lead, the white precipitate is not gelatinous. That is the only difference between them when you are using sodium hydroxide. Now, let's take the other solution. This time around now, we are adding ammonia. We are adding ammonia solution in drops. Don't forget this contains lead 2 ion. So we are adding ammonia in drops. You see, white precipitate. It is not gelatinous. Let add add it in excess. You see now that it's not giving you a clear solution, unlike this. This is when you add excess sodium hydroxide to lead salt. 
This is when you add excess ammonia to lead salt. Excess ammonia, excess sodium hydroxide. Now, the, you see the difference between the two. The white precipitate in the case of ammonia, when it is added in excess, is what? Is insoluble. And the white precipitate is not gelatinous. So don't get confused. There is a chemistry of the reaction behind that. If I'm, I'm going to tell you that as we continue. Now, let's go to another cation. Another cation that you want to test for is iron 2. Iron 2 salt. Iron 2 salt. This is iron 2 salt. I label it as G. Iron 2 salt. In the same vein, we are going to divide it into two. Divide it into two. Okay. So you first try with sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide in drops. What color is this? This is green gelatinous precipitate. It is gelatinous, green. Add excess to it. The green color is still there. It's not becoming clearer like this. So how do you write it now? So in this case, now this is letter G. G plus sodium hydroxide solution in drops. You have green gelatinous precipitate. You see it on the board. And uh, by the time you add it in excess, what do you have? The green gelatinous precipitate remains insoluble. It does not dissolve. This is dirty green gelatinous precipitate. The green color is dirty. Maybe on your screen it may be looking like black. It is not actually black in a classroom experiment. So it's supposed to be dirty green gelatinous precipitate. It is the screen that is showing it to be black. What I'm holding here is dirty green gelatinous precipitate. I would advise you when you get to school, ask your teacher to give you iron two salt and perform the experiment yourself. You know, chemistry is, practical, is a practical subject and you are going to get it. Green gelatinous, dirty green gelatinous precipitate. Good. Now to the second portion, we are adding ammonia solution in drops. Then, this is also dirty green. It may appear as if it is black on the screen. It is not black. It's the background that is making it to be so. So it's dirty green gelatinous precipitate. Sometimes when green color it appears as if it is dirty, it may, it, may, it may be like black, but it's not actually black. So let's add it in excess. Okay. The dirty green gelatinous precipitate is still there. Good. So far so good, we have carried out tests on about four cations now, but we still have one cation left to test for, and that is ion three salt. Ion three salt. This is ion three chloride that has been dissolved in water. Ion three chloride. So as usual, we are going to divide the ion three salt into two. So this is a portion of it. Then we have another portion here of ion three salt. The ion three salt is labeled as H. H. Because the name of the salt is not going to be given to you. So what are we going to do? We add sodium hydroxide in drops at first. So. You can see the color is brown. Okay, I think this color is better on the screen. It gives you brown color. When you add excess to it, the color should still remain brown. So you see that 
the brown color is still there. So brown, gelatinous precipitate, and it is insoluble in excess. So let's try ammonia with the second portion. Add it in drops. Let's go to our table that you are going to see on the screen, at least to give us the summary of what we have done so far. I still put what we did last week there because it's a continuous topic. All right. You will see X plus sodium hydroxide in drops and then in excess. At least we can see the observation and the inference. The same way with letter Y. The observation, I believe you have seen it, and the inference letter G, and so on. So far, so good, we have come to the end of today's class. But before we call it a day, I would like to give you this assignment because of, which I would like to look at in our next class. And the assignment is that, describe how to test for the following anions. Describe how to test for the following anions. The anions are displaced on the board. HCO3 minus, CO3 2 minus, Cl minus, SO4 2 minus, SO3 2 minus, S2 minus, and NO3 minus. Describe how to test for the following anions. Until we meet next time, God bless you all.